And it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Uh, we have three speakers today. First, first of all is uh, Dr. Catherine Pound. Catherine is an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics in the uh, Division of Pediatric Medicine. And she's also director of research for that division. And uh, in addition, she's chair of the Nutrition and Gastroenterology Committee of the Canadian Pediatric Society. Uh, she holds, um, well, Catherine completed medical school at McGill and then uh, her residency in pediatrics here at uh, the University of Ottawa, and then went on to complete a, an MSc in uh, epidemiology uh, relatively recently. Uh, she has a, a particular interest in research in the area of breastfeeding, has published uh, significantly in this area, and has uh, also acquired uh, a, a reasonable amount of uh, grants, I would say, in, in the area of breastfeeding and uh, is, is really uh, moving this, uh, this area forward. Uh, she will be joined by Catherine Charbonneau, who is a registered nurse uh, at, in the NICU at CHEO. And Catherine has worked in the perinatal um, area for at least 15 years. Uh, she completed a Master's of Advanced uh, Practice Nursing at the University of uh, Victoria and uh, has particular interests in breastfeeding and uh, went on to complete a, um, a certification as a board certified lactation consultant uh, around eight years ago. And so clearly has uh, considerable expertise in the area. And, and the uh, final member of the group is uh, Stephanie uh, Davenport. Stephanie completed her medical school at the University of Sydney and then went on to train in pediatrics here at uh, Chio University of Ottawa. Uh, did some uh, training in neonatology and then went on to complete a fellowship in emergency medicine where she uh, works and was working overnight. And as you can see from her attire, she's uh, just, uh, just finished a shift in the, uh, in the emergency department. Uh, she um, uh, has a, a particular interest in breastfeeding, not amply uh, supported by the fact that she's three children uh, whom she uh, was uh, supporting in that way for quite a number of years. So I think we have a, 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 an eclectic mix of experience from a breastfeeding perspective. And I uh, look forward to, uh, to the talk, but it will focus on breastfeeding best practice guideline implementation at CHEO, trial of the lactation consultant role. And I think Catherine uh, Pound is going to lead us on. All right, well, thank you so much for uh, the introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, so I'm going to get things started with a brief introduction of our talk, and then I'll pass it on to Catherine Charbonneau, who really is the real star of this show. And we'll introduce you uh, to the absolutely amazing IBCLC pilot project that she's managed to put together. So first, I want to state that we have no conflict of interest to disclose. And also, as per the University of Ottawa affirmation, we want to pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. And we acknowledge their longstanding relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all Indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. And we acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders past, present and future. So over the next 45 minutes or so, we'll discuss the importance of lactation services in our facility. We'll talk about the impact of the role of lactation consultants on infant outcomes and how to consult for lactation support. We'll identify three breastfeeding best practices and discuss the partnership with the Monarch system and how to consult their services. Next slide. So I think I'm preaching to the choir here. So I'll go through this very quickly, obviously, as I suspect everyone here knows why breastfeeding is important. So we know that it's crucial to baby's health as it decreases the risk of multiple infectious illnesses. Uh, it's been linked to, uh, can you just go back one slide? Sorry, Catherine. Oh, okay. Can you go forward one slide? And one more? <laughs> not the other way. <laughs> I was hoping for a glitch-free presentation. This is not off to a good start. Sorry, so my slides are out of order. I apologize. Anyway, so we know that uh, breastfeeding is crucial to baby's health. It's been linked to a decrease uh, in sudden infant death syndrome. 
and it reduces the risk of necrotizing enterocolitis in preterm infants, and, and I could go on. Uh, we also know that it's crucial to the mother's health. It protects against depression and anxiety, and it decreases the risk of ovarian and breast cancer. We know it's a cost saving to society as well, especially in a publicly funded healthcare system like the one we have in Canada, with past studies having shown a 30% decrease in infection related hospitalization in infants aged zero to four months with each additional month of exclusive breastfeeding, which is fairly significant. And then finally, we know that infant formula comes with a significant carbon footprint from feeding the cattle, obtaining and processing the cow's milk, storing it, transporting it. Uh, in fact, according to a paper published in BMJ a couple of years ago now, carbon emission savings gained by supporting mothers to breastfeed in the UK would equate to taking between 50 and 77,000 cars off the road each year. So I think it's pretty clear that as healthcare professionals, we need to do everything we can to support exclusive breastfeeding. Uh, so previous slide. <laughs> um, the one before that. So briefly, we'll talk about Canada for a second. So these numbers are just a few years old now, and they come from publicly available data pulled from the Canadian Community Health Survey. So as you can see, initi initiation rates are high, but they drop off quickly over the next weeks to months. And we're far out from the recommendation of exclusive breastfeeding up until six months of age. All right, so now this is all interesting, but you may wonder what it has to do with you as healthcare providers. And I think it's not always clear to us that we have quite an important role to play in this. So when I look at physicians' roles and impact on breastfeeding, I like to approach it from a multidimensional perspective because it really is the result of multiple factors that interplay together. And while I tend to talk about physicians specifically because this is the research that I do, uh, the same really applies to all healthcare professionals. So we know from the literature that physicians' recommendations directly impact the mother's decision to breastfeed. And now this isn't a one-time thing, right? Deciding to breastfeed is a decision that a mother makes every day, every feed. So our role really continues throughout the breastfeeding relationship. And what the evidence shows us is that healthcare providers' recommendations not only direct uh, directly impact breastfeeding duration, but a lack of discussion about breastfeeding is often seen by patients as a tacit agreement or even encouragement to use infant formula. So we need to be comfortable enough to talk about it. And then another thing to remember is the importance of maternal confidence in her abilities to breastfeed, because that in and of itself is a very strong predictor of breastfeeding success. And that maternal confidence can very much be impacted by healthcare providers' comments and support and ability to help with the challenges that come up when the breastfeeding relationship is being established. Next slide. Um, so it makes sense that at the center of this circle is all the healthcare professionals and their knowledge and level of comfort with not only discussing breastfeeding, but identifying issues and troubleshooting when issues do come up. And unfortunately, despite the very important uh, impact that healthcare professionals have on the breastfeeding decisions of their patients, we know that many of us lack the skills and knowledge to help breastfeeding mothers. And therefore we need people who know what they're doing um, like the program that Catherine's going to talk about. And we know that this is not just a CHEO issue. Next slide, please. So as you can see on the map here, a simple PubMed search will quickly return publications from many regions of the world where healthcare workers lack of knowledge and skills in relation to breastfeeding has been documented. This is far from an exhaustive list, but I think it's pretty clear that it's an issue that we see everywhere. So how does this relate to us here at CHEO? I mean, how do we know that we also have an issue with breastfeeding support at CHEO? Um, so briefly, this journey for me started more than a decade ago now. Uh, in our first study, we collected data on breastfeeding support by healthcare professionals at CHEO, and we found that 40% of breastfeeding mothers whose infants were admitted with jaundice received no help while they were admitted, and that only 4% of mothers of admitted patients received breastfeeding help from a physician. And although we didn't ask for any qualitative data at that point, we received pages and pages of unsolicited feedback, really, where mothers discussed how difficult and confusing their admission to hospital was. Because when they did get breastfeeding support, they often got lots of conflicting recommendations. And overall, they just felt really unsupported. Now, although this study is more than 10 years old now, um, I think you'll find that Catherine's data shows that nothing has changed, really. 
Now, our second breastfeeding related study was a randomized control trial looking at the impact of an in-hospital lactation specialist on breastfeeding rates in children admitted to hospital with jaundice. And the qualitative part of the study is what I want to touch on right now, as it focused on mother's experiences in the hospital. And the moms in the control group, so the moms who had access to regular care that we give in our hospital, like without lactation consultant advice, were quite vocal about the lack of breastfeeding support they experienced in the hospital. And they felt very strongly that the healthcare practitioners they interacted with really didn't know much about breastfeeding. On the other hand, the mothers we had in the intervention group, the ones who received help from a lactation consultant, felt confident to breastfeed. And that's crucial because we know, we talked about it a little bit earlier, that maternal confidence is a strong predictor of breastfeeding outcomes. Um, now, as I alluded to before, CHEO is far from the only place where this is an issue. And now in the interest of time, and because I want to pass it on to Catherine, who has a ton to say about the pilot program she's implemented, I won't say much about our other studies, but suffice it to say that we documented a lack of breastfeeding knowledge in healthcare professionals, not just at CHEO, but truly all over the country. So I'm now going to pass it on to Catherine, who will talk to you about her program and how it's truly making a difference in the lives of our patients at CHEO and in their breastfeeding success. Catherine, you're muted. Something's never changed, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Pound. That's great. Um, I kind of wanted to start on a similar vein, just looking at some of the evidence. Um, and we know that uh, there's this great study that was done looking at uh, quality improvement efforts to boost human milk exposure. And uh, what they really identified is human milk is medicine. And so we know with all of these uh, antibodies and growth factors and immunoglobulins that are really not found in any other synthetic food source um, that, you know, we have a great opportunity to provide better health to our infants and then especially ill infants. And so when we look at, you know, the fact that feeding human milk is better tolerated, it's digested more quickly, um, it actually stimulates gastrointestinal system growth, uh, improves resistance to infection, and leads to better absorption of nutrients. And so how could we say no to this? <laughs> um, so we have powerful uh, properties to offer our patients. And in addition to what Dr. Pound was mentioning about the cost effectiveness, um, Mercado had completed a study and what they showed is um, by introducing human milk that they were able to decrease uh, rates of necrotizing enterocolitis, uh, decreased infection rates, decreased hospital readmissions. Um, you know, and so overall, by improving breastfeeding outcomes, they were able to reduce overall morbidities and therefore reduce associated costs. Um, you know, for us at CHEO alone, we see over 3,000 infants uh, with feeding-related issues through ED each year. Uh, we were able to pull some of our data. Similarly, on the wards, it's about 1,500. And we know that we actually spend about $6,000 a year on uh, human donor milk for babies in the NICU. So there's lots of opportunities to, um, you know, approach those, uh, those cost-saving measures um, from human milk. And uh, additionally, we want to look at um, that sort of engaging mothers. We know that this, like none of this would be possible without uh, the engagement from families. And so a lot of the approach of the IBCLC is really um, providing that information and education to families and really informing them about the value of human milk um, and then really supporting. So that early initiation of um, moving milk, whether it's directly at the breast or by pumping um, consistency, and then um, again, that encouragement piece. So when we look at, you know, what is the impact of the IBCLC um, again, uh, Mercado and also Dr. Rebecca Hoban out of um, the Hospital of Sick Children. She's the director of human milk science and she recently published um, a study really looking at the impact of an IBCLC. Um, they have about uh, three LCs six days a week at sick kids and um, a significantly, you know, 
massive program uh, altogether. But what they were able to see is by really focusing in on supporting families to uh, produce milk, whether they wanted to breastfeed directly, um, they found you know, increases in exclusive breastfeeding rates, increases in number of infants that are directly breastfeeding, um, you know, overall, a significantly higher rate of human milk became available. And so that seems to be a real focus um, uh, for her research, but also the impact on families is um, quite obvious. Uh, so with our project, we really honed in on three best practices. And so we looked at hand expression, skin to skin, and the expression of human milk. And uh, with hand expression, um, uh, Dr. Jane Morton has done some studies looking at uh, hand expression in the early days postpartum and the impact on uh, milk volumes. And they showed that in the first seven days with hand expression, that milk came in sooner and in greater volumes. And we know with skin to skin that babies actually gain weight faster. Um, they directly breastfeed sooner and breastfeed for longer. And part of, I think of our babies, you know, post-operatively that are maybe, you know, NPO or getting a lot of their feeds by nasal gastric tubes and um, we're really focused on weights. Those are babies that we really want to get skin to skin so we can really um, spare those calories and spend that time too. But we know skin to skin is it elicits the oxytocin release um, that really helps with milk ejection and stimulating mom's milk. So there's like so many factors that come into play. And then with the expression of human milk, um, we know that the breast is sort of a supply, supply and demand organ. So if we're not emptying it, it's not making milk. And so we really want to get moms pumping and moving milk early um, directly at the breast with big breast compressions. And um, so a lot of our work in education is focused on providing education to staff and families. IBCL what? International Board Certified Lactation Consultant. That's what IBCLC stands for. Um, there's three pathways for certification. And so you have to have sort of a accredited health science uh, program degree, um, a minimum of 95 hours of lactation specific education with a focus of five hours on communication skills. Uh, anywhere from a minimum of 300 to 1,000 hours, depending on your clinical experience, can be applied. And all of this has to be completed five years immediately prior to writing your exam. And then we have an adherence to a professional code of conduct as well. So before we started our project, we really wanted to have a look to see what was happening kind of across Canada to give us uh, a better picture of sort of what would be a reasonable standard of care. And you can see, this is just a small profile. Uh, we were able to access most hospitals in Canada that provide um, breastfeeding support, whether it was uh, inborn hospitals that had NICUs or specifically children's hospitals. Most hospitals had at least sort of a one and a half uh, point code to support their needs. And then just depending on um, if babies were actually inborn, there would seem to be obviously um, more support there as well. So with our breastfeeding best practice guideline implementation, we sort of started by doing a gap analysis to say, what does CHEO currently do? What does the best practice say? We identified a few gaps, uh, several gaps. <laughs> and um, from there, we kind of created our plan of action. We were able to get some pre-implementation feedback from uh, nurses, residents, and parents. Um, over a hundred parents uh, responded to a survey that we were able to distribute. So we got some really rich feedback. And then we kind of did an environmental scan to see, you know, like, what are our needs? What equipment do we have? Um, and then from there, we focused in on three facets. So we went, you know, education for staff, uh, mentoring and leadership of a lactation consultant, and then resource development. Um, the staff education uh, took an approach of sort of like incentive based. Uh, so staff could complete the online Best Start breastfeeding course. Um, upon completion, they could uh, submit their certificates of completion and put their name in for a draw for prizes. Um, we had pretty good uptake with that approach. And then additionally, um, leaders were chosen from different units. Um, we actually had an interdisciplinary opportunity. Uh, we had really uh, a lot of keen interest from the occupational therapists and 
the dietitian. So we were able to offer an eight hour breastfeeding course to about 35 uh, nurses. Um, and then in addition, another uh, 35 uh, interdisciplinary team members, including residents. So thank you again to Dr. Pound, she was able to offer um, uh, some education to the residents and the fellows. And so we're hoping to continue some of that as well. Uh, with our implementation, we started in the NICU uh, inpatient medicine um, for the first six weeks of our pilot project, and we came in hard at six days a week, and uh, this was really gratifying work. Um, there was, uh, we really had no idea what our breastfeeding needs would be, but we um, hit the ground running, and within sort of three or four weeks into the project, we could see the needs were quite high, and that uh, we were hoping to expand, and so we were granted an expansion um, till the end of March, which we were offering support to the entire hospital, um, inpatient areas, uh, three days a week, and uh, we could see that the needs were much greater than three days a week. So we're happy to report will be available um, starting May 1st, uh, five days a week um, through the summer, the spring and summer. So that's uh, gonna give us a little bit more time and traction to really support families. And then with our resources, um, you know, if prior to our project, if you chugled uh, breastfeeding, you would come up empty. We didn't really have any resources um, about breastfeeding, uh, including our parent website. So we were able to put some breastfeeding resources available for staff and families. And then we also looked at our pumping equipment, um, just kind of streamlining and standardizing, um, which we're still working through. Um, and then uh, we created a breastfeeding promotion poster and it was uh, created to link families, sort of a quick couple bullet points on our three best practices, but then also linking families directly with a QR code to our breastfeeding resources online. And then as well, we were able to gather real-time feedback from families. So there's a parent survey that's linked through a QR code as well. Uh, we had really not a way to document a full breastfeeding assessment prior to our project, so we were able to update our EPIC documentation um, very quickly, and uh, we were really thankful for that support to even create the lactation consultant orders. So we, we, we've evaluated everything and we are reporting our findings. Um, you know, our ultimate goal is really sustaining these breastfeeding best practices. Uh, our goal is to become a leader in breastfeeding best practices for pediatric centers in Canada. Uh, part of our project um, and accountability to the RNAO is to choose sort of three indicators um, and then to continuously track them. So we, we chose a structural a process and an outcome indicator uh, related to providing education. So we'll re be reporting annually, hoping that we continue to educate staff. Um, the goal for RNAO is about 50% based on their numbers. Um, and then with the process indicator, we'll be reporting monthly. And it's meant to show that as we provide education to staff that we're starting to see more and more um, breastfeeding families receive breastfeeding assessments. So we're able to pull that from our documentation. And then we were recently able to hone in on our outcome indicator. We're a bit unique in that we're not a birthing center and a lot of the best practices can focus in on birth centers. And so uh, we are gonna focus on um, sort of gauging the number of infants zero to six months who are receiving human milk. And again, we'll be able to pull that from our documentation from our ins and outs, uh, whether they're directly breastfeeding or receiving um, pumped milk. And then uh, we're able to continuously get that feedback from parents. So I'm going to present some of our parent satisfaction. And uh, what we were really hoping is for an increased self-reported knowledge and confidence from staff. So before we kind of got rolling, we were trying to get the word out and we had incredible support that we've been really thankful for. Um, Chio has like, a, you know, this incredible communications department to share information and really promote the great work that's being done. And so we had, you know, stuff up on ChioNet. Uh, we were tweeting and Facebooking and all kinds of great things. Um, and actually uh, CBC had reached out um, and uh, had profiled our program um, in an article. So it was uh, exciting for us. So, so far with our education, we've been able to educate 151 staff and that's um, including our interdisciplinary team members. Um, we're hoping sort of for future opportunities with the, the new residents that are gonna be coming in this July, um, but also, uh, we have an RNAO fellowship uh, grant um, 
currently. And so we're looking at how can we support our new nurses. So, we, you know, prior to this project, we really didn't have a structured way to educate staff about breastfeeding. And so uh, part of my RNAO fellowship will be looking at setting up some onboarding education for uh, new staff. So the results um, in our first, I'm just going to profile the six week pilot project. And so we were able to see um, uh, 67 families in our first six weeks. Uh, what we quickly recognized is our needs were very tightly focused on the sort of zero to three month age group. Uh, in the NICU, our goal is to see basically every admission. Um, we were able to see 91% of the admissions in that period of time. But even for families who don't want to breastfeed, um, they still have engorgement and may have questions. And so we're hoping to meet with them as well. And I guess that would be probably one of my plugs is basically anyone who's breastfeeding. Um, if they have an ill infant, uh, it's a totally different ball game. And we would love to be um, consulted in those cases. So in terms of uh, the number of admissions, we were able to see almost half of the admissions up on four East and uh, similarly on five East. So it was very uh, encouraging to see those numbers and kind of identify what are the breastfeeding needs. Um, what we were able to document as we saw families was, um, you know, majority was a transition to breastfeeding, whether patients had been uh, NPO for a period of time and they were trying to get back directly to the breast or if they were transitioning and um, they were in a pumping scenario. So we were helping them maintain their milk supply. Um, I think it's no surprise that low milk supply was uh, also like a pretty dominant factor. Uh, anytime we stop stimulating the breast, um, it's not uncommon for families to come in through emerge and sort of have like, you know, crisis mode for the next six hours and not have an opportunity to pump milk or um, to feed sometimes. So. I would say that's like definitely um, the other factors that and the other presenting needs, I would say we're often in combination with those two main. So in terms of a confidence, we looked at a number of questions that sort of rated self-reported confidence. Um, I feel confident, neutral or not confident to teach families how to hand express their milk. And so our confidence doubled in our post-implantation survey. Um, staff were reporting um, an increase in confidence by 25% for the ability um, to support families to express their milk. And then skin to skin is kind of an interesting one. We actually didn't see much of a change pre or po um, in, in our post uh, surveys. And what we're finding actually is some of it's environmental and we, we can have um, you know, families that are really desiring a bit more privacy for skin to skin, but are in a busy room where people are coming in and out, or, you know, it could be a wide open bay or whatever it is. So uh, some of the feedback from families is um, sometimes the bed spots that are right at the door, uh, they feel like it's constant traffic. Um, so we're just looking at ways that we can provide a little bit more privacy by bringing the curtains around and moving the equipment around a little bit. So it's a safe environment if you need to get to safety equipment, but also to kind of give those families that little bit of privacy that they're um, desiring. And also um, even looking at moving families to closer to the window whenever possible. Sometimes those bed spots are just a little bit easier to um, provide skin to skin. So that's gonna be one of our focuses for sure. And then with providing um, education about chest feeding and sort of looking at, you know, the needs of all of our families and recognizing uh, the use of our language and how we support uh, families' goals to feed their babies. So we talked a lot about, um, you know, all types of families that we'll be seeing. Uh, and we doubled our um, confidence in this area. So two questions we're kind of wanting to know about knowledge. Do you know where to find resources? Um, do staff know, uh, feel like they learned something new since the project began? 88% um, said, yes, I learned something new. So yay, we felt like that was good. That was positive feedback. Um, and then in terms of where to find resources, we had sent out weekly emails, which um, you may or may not have enjoyed, uh, but it gave us an opportunity to like share our feedback and we were getting so many questions and just great questions, but um, wanting to share resources and kind of keep it uh, communicated. So this is an example of the feedback that we received from families prior to our project. And 
So we, you know, you can see that um, about, I sort of block it into 20% uh, blocks here, but basically about 20% were lacking support, um, a supportive breastfeeding environment or attitude. So there was either like a comment that was made or we had examples where, you know, people were breastfeeding in bathrooms. They were trying to find places where they could pump their milk um, in a private environment um, or somewhere comfortable where they could feed their babies. And that was really lacking. Um, in terms of milk supply issues, it would be a comment along the lines of um, nobody helped me pump my milk. Um, it was about 11%. Uh, thankfully, we had, you know, a good, gr a good group of about 20% that had a really positive experience, um, was very thankful for the help that they received and knowledgeable staff. And so it was great to hear that. Um, and neutral or just did not need help. Uh, about 25% was, you know, and this is why a lot of our focus has been on education. Um, parents were identifying that staff were at lacking education. Sometimes they were feeling like they needed to do research themselves to show reasons why they could feed or not. Um, and then I had sort of a category of uh, unique needs. So if they identified that, you know, their infant had had cardiac surgery or there was a premature infant or something really specific, like a critically Ill, Ill infant, we categorize that as um, they would have benefited from uh, lactation support. And so the good news, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see in my screen, but I wonder if I can move this over. I can't. But the good news is um, pre-implementation parents were rating our breastfeeding support 4.2 out of 10. And following um, our project, they're rating at 9.6 out of 10. So we feel like that's a really great success. And obviously it's uh, attributed to great support and uptake of our um, program. Uh, you can see anywhere it's blue that that was the increases. Um, orange is our pre-information. And so we were, um, you know, parents were saying that I was supported to pump my milk um, up to 100% uh, in the post survey. In terms of um, hand expression was taught, same thing. Um, nice uh, results up in the, I think it's like 80%. Or, no, I think it was 100% as well. And then with uh, during my stay opportunities for skin to skin, um, again, and nice increases there too, to 65%. These were our, um, the gap analysis <laughs> findings. And so what we found within that first six weeks is we were able to say, you know, yay, we were able to, uh, you know, look at some education for staff and provide LC support and resources are online. And uh, we've been looking, we're going to talk with the Monarch Center and looking at bridges to the community to support our families. Uh, we had updated our documentation and staff were saying great things about their self-reported knowledge and education. So we've had lots of great accomplishments in this time. Um, you know, this is an example of the poster that we had put together and the QR codes that link families. So these are in each of the patient rooms. If you're ever trying to link families to resources to find uh, pumping equipment, um, it's the most, you know, up to date. Uh, OttawaBreastfeeds.ca is kind of our go to. Uh, it has all of the breastfeeding drop ins that have been adjusted during COVID are all up to date on this website. So it's a great resource. Uh, we now have an email address, which we've been getting consults and questions and communicating even with other centers. It's been a great way to um, keep in contact and uh, provide feedback if needed. Uh, and then our breastfeeding up, uh, website got updated. We had pictures of like sort of a five-year-old. So we were able to share some of our pictures from our CBC um, article. And again, um, we're really thankful to the Champlain Maternal Regional Newborn Program. They were able to support our education. Um, they typically offer their course for almost $200 and they offered it for free, the eight hour course to our staff. And uh, they're a partner of ours and have supported us for many years with our NICU education. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to give a little shout out and especially to the Epic team because they rocked and got all of our stuff up uh, really quickly. In terms of our future initiatives, um, you know, right now we're working on an RNEO fellowship. Uh, we're going to continue with ongoing education. So we're hoping to provide uh, the eight hour course again in June. And then also um, with our champions, we're going to be starting sort of a monthly uh, educational Zoom, probably be about a half an hour with maybe a 15 minute um, topic of interest and then some discussion. Um, 
And then uh, we have uh, Elena uh, Lakoff is working on a loaner pump program. We have families that will come from out of town. They're staying at the um, Rotel or they're staying at Ronald McDonald House and they are unable to pump their milk all night um, or finding, especially with COVID, it's very challenging for families to get pumps. Um, and so we had a lot, a lot of great support from Adela and we're gonna be looking at uh, helping families pump their milk. And then, uh, you know, again, a big focus for us is looking at the space for staff. We really, we recently, even in the last two weeks, have received feedback that, you know, staff are pumping in washrooms and trying to find places to maintain their milk supply. So we really need to focus on this um, for our own team at our institution. And, uh, and then especially for families, they're asking for, you know, comfortable places for them to feed their families. So, um, I just wanted to profile that uh, anyone can order uh, a lactation consultant consult. Um, the nursing staff, that was a bit of a learning curve for them because we don't typically put in orders, but I know in Emerge, they've been awesome. And so looking at, um, we are gonna be available from 8.30 to 4.35 days a week till the end of the summer. So spread the good word. And I'll pass it along to Dr. Stephanie Davenport. Thanks, Catherine. Um, most people are probably familiar with the Monarch Center, but for those who are not familiar, Monarch is an Ottawa center that really makes it their goal to help transition babies and families and the first six, six weeks of life from their sort of birth center or wherever they were born to uh, the care of their, their primary uh, physician. Um, Monarch and Chio have had an informal relationship for, for many years, but I'm happy to say that in the last several weeks, we've been working really hard to establish a more formal relationship with them. Monarch uh, is consisted of many physicians, nurses, as well as lactation consultants, all of whom are highly skilled and specialized in the area of, of newborn health. So who are the babies that we're gonna be referring to the Monarch Center? So whether these are babies that have seen a lactation consultant at CHEO, or for example, being seen in the emergency department, perhaps outside the hours with which they can see a lactation consultant, um, we can refer any babies that there are concerns about um, poor weight gain or breastfeeding issues. And Monarch will see up to uh, six weeks of age, and that's the corrected gestational age. So they will see two or three month old, um, you know, X 25 weekers that have concerns they will still see those babies. Um, they are also uh, able to see uh, babies that you might have a concern that have a lip tie or a tongue tie. And on site, Monarch is able to treat babies that are four weeks of age and younger, and they will uh, assess and refer elsewhere babies that are older than four weeks, so up to six weeks. Monarch is also seeing babies uh, for uh, any concerns about, about hyperbilirubinemia. Um, they will see all babies for bilirubin concerns up to two weeks of age. Um, their sort of parameters for their bilirubin are that they can see bilirubin quickly. So if you have a concern or a bilirubin that needs follow-up within 24 hours, they can absolutely do that. As long as it's not on a Saturday, you're not seeing them on a Saturday and want a, a Sunday repeat because they are not open on Sundays. And they have to be able for Monarch's processing they have to be able to, to see the baby and um, take the blood for, uh, for the billy before noon on the day that you want it done. They have uh, their sort of head physician there is Dr. David Miller and any critical results are immediately forwarded to him and the babies will be called and, and likely referred back to CHEO for, for management. <laughs> So how to make a referral to the Monarch Center. So we are working very hard to get this electronically put into Epic. But for now, if you want to make a referral to the Monarch Center, you need to actually print their referral form off of their website, fill it out and fax it in. We need as much clinical information about the baby, although a Monarch is now able to read our Epic notes so they can have some of the background information about the baby, but they need the physician full number and billing number as well as the infant health card number. Okay, so this uh, concludes our presentation. For those of you who are interested in breastfeeding counseling resources that are based on the evidence we gathered as part of our research and based on the knowledge gaps we identified specifically in Canadian physicians, uh, my team and I created a uh, web-based breastfeeding curriculum that can be accessed through the iLearn modules. 
and I think somebody's going to put those in the chat. Uh, and if you don't have access to iLearn, the modules can also be accessed through the CHEO resource page. Um, and then uh, finally, we also built a web-based app uh, that you can see a screenshot of there, the uh, latchedapp.com, um, which uh, you can see on the screen that was built with the goal of being used during breastfeeding encounters to help uh, healthcare professionals navigate some uh, basic breastfeeding issues. Mm -hmm. like so, so time we'll, uh, for uh, comments, questions, and uh, we'll open it up. Um, Heather, do you want to ask a question? Yes, I don't have video. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, everyone. I, I did post a question in um, in the chat, but I did want to say that as pediatric medicine attendings, I read the lactation consultant notes. So we're even informally learning from uh, what what you're teaching the parents and also ubiquitously it's been positive feedback from all of the parents I've been looking after and you know it's been 15 years probably since my residency and we've been wanting it since then for sure so it, for a lifelong you know a resident long uh, stay at CHEO this has been something we've been wanting. Steph the question I posted if you can see it was just at one point when they established the monarch I believe it was a trial for babies born through TOH as follow-up for the general and the civic. And so babies originally that weren't born there were not eligible to be seen. But can we infer through the consultation process now that they would see any, any baby? That's right, yeah. So for a long time, they would only see babies that had a T, that were born at TOH because they needed a TOH MRN in order to process any blood work that might need to happen. But we have now worked out a relationship with them and our lab is able to process the same um, blood work that might need to be done. So um, absolutely any baby that is seen at CHEO and has a CHEO MRN can be sent to, to uh, the Monarch. Other questions or comments? Uh, Catherine uh, Charbonneau, uh, can I just ask you a little bit about the space issue and uh, where where things are at? From uh, you know, you alluded to a number of challenges uh, from the space point of view. So where where are things at from that point of view, and uh, are you know are things moving forward? Because space is a huge issue within within the hospital. Well, this is it. it seems to be our barrier to basically everything. <laughs> space. So um, we were able to reach out to uh, our occupational health department and also to um, some of our managers to see what spaces are actually available currently. And so what we're hoping to do is work with, with uh, Marie Belanger to create a map um, of CHEO and show the spaces that are available for families currently for pumping. And we do have um, a room on 4 East on 5 East. Uh, we have a critical care pumping room, and those are all designed for patients currently. And so what we're finding, our greatest barrier is actually finding a space that is separate uh, for family or for staff. And, um, you know, I think we could say, like, if I was about, if I had come out of a pumping room and the patient I'm caring for is coming into the pumping room that I just used, um, we're just wondering, you know, it, could there be a space that would be separate for staff, uh, you know, I've heard of uh, people lending out keys to offices and things like this. I think um, we have a responsibility, Ottawa, you know, from the uh, Ontario Public Health, who has a document of how to create uh, a breastfeeding friendly space. And so um, we are uh, hoping to put in a proposal for the library space. That's one of our goals. <laughs> but what I'd say is we really, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a glamorous space, but it'd be nice to have somewhere that's appropriate. Okay, well, clearly it's uh, something that is uh, required. Uh, Amy? Yeah, um, I just have a quick question about Monarch, and apologies, Stephanie, if you actually... Just having a little difficulty hearing you. Oh, sorry. Okay, better. My apologies, Stephanie, if you actually answered this in your comment about the Monarch. So I understand we can refer for Billy follow-up, we can refer for lactation consultant. Is the lactation consultant um, work uh, 
charged is or is that somehow covered under their their services right and usually you have to pay for private lactation consultants so i'm just wondering about how that works at the monarch my understanding is that um, as long as we we are as a physician are referring to monarch for lactation consultation then they are able to bill ohip so there wouldn't be a charge to the family that's great to know and and do they have a lot of um space like i mean i just think of i i the service is so great i'm so happy to hear about it just thinking that you know we sometimes have families present outside of hours and it doesn't sound like we can refer them from the eMERGE to come back the next day to see the lactation consultant, right? That's that's not how the process is working yet at GEO. So I was just wondering. Um, yeah, the, I mean, that would be, I think, difficult. I think the idea would be to keep the babies out of the emergency department if, if possible to decrease their risk, especially recently with COVID and everything like that. Um, but they, they have said to us that over the last several weeks since our initiative has really taken off that they have been uh, getting a lot more consultations, which is great. But my understanding is they're very happy and they're still able to accommodate all the extra referrals. Uh, Hillary. Hi, everyone. I also don't have uh, video. Sorry. Just to say uh, in my hat as a Montfort uh, pediatrician, any babies born at the Montfort, we can certainly handle, we have a clinic also like Monarch every day of the week, including weekend service. Uh, we do tongue ties and um, breastfeeding support as well as Billy's with readmission. So Amy, for example, if you're looking for someone to be seen the next day, uh, that can always be done with Montfort babies and then also community referrals. And we'd like to, um, remind everyone that we uh, provide bilingual services. So for those Francophone families where, who are struggling for services, that's something that uh, we pride ourselves on providing. Other questions or comments? I don't see any more hands up and I don't see anything in the chat. Um, so uh, just like to thank you all for your excellent presentation and good luck with your work. I think it's very important and uh, needs to be supported. Uh, so uh, I certainly would uh, encourage um, those present to, to spread the word and uh, to, um, uh, to really encourage um, utilization of the service. So thank you all. Great, thank you.